Hey everyone, I just wanted to post a little video kind of overviewing some of the stuff, the extra material that I added to our curriculum this week. Just a little extra writing on the ground rules, ground rules of foraging, just to keep you guys safe as we dive into this. Uh, before I get into that, I had a phone call with some of you earlier this week, and one of the questions was how to do a spore print. So I put together a quick video about that, and I will post that separately. Another question was on uh, mushrooms. I got a picture from California of a little brown mushroom, and we can call those LBMs because they are notoriously hard to identify. Uh, we went through the key that was in Mushrooms Demystified, and we both arrived at possibly a, I think it's pronounced Satharella, um, P-S-A-T-H-Y-R-E-L-L-A. -L -L and these are relatively common uh, mushrooms that are just little and brown. And one of the comments was that it can be really, really overwhelming to learn about mushrooms because there are so many of them. And that's true. It can be overwhelming. There are a lot of mushrooms out there. And right now, some of you don't know any mushrooms, and that's totally fine. It's very easy for that to them seem daunting to dive into. That's why we have this mentorship. Every time you notice a mushroom, every time you look up one mushroom, every time you figure out a little bit about a mushroom, even if you don't figure out its name, just by recognizing that mushroom, you now have one mushroom that you know. It's like walking into a room of new people. Um, you don't know anybody at first, but you talk to one person and things start to open up. So with regards to small mushrooms, have heart. We'll move through it. Ask me as many questions as you want. Get on that mushroom observer and um, Mushrooms are a whole kingdom. They're one of the six major kingdoms of uh, organisms, but we can definitely start to ID them. So in terms of the overwhelm, we're at the beginning. Don't worry, it can seem like a lot. Take it one step at a time, and if you just stay on track, stay on target, you will really blow yourself away with how much you can learn. So on to what I included on the ground rules of foraging. Let's see here. Uh, I just wanted to remind you about the Doodle polls. So please get on Doodle. Let's set up some times to do those weekly calls. And then let's get a time where we can all, uh, hopefully most of us can get on that monthly video call. Um, the reading this week is for pages one through 13 of Botany in a Day. Just a quick introduction to botany. I think it gets in a little bit into about evolution, um, things like that. Please read that link I sent to you about mushroom poisonings. I'm not trying to scare you away from mushrooms. I'm not saying that anybody's gonna poison themselves. They're not going to, but there's a lot of fear around mushroom poisoning. So it's good to do a quick read about that. See what what is out there, what could possibly hurt you um, and learn about what the signs might be. Even if you just read it once, that'll make you feel a lot more comfortable um, if and when you do start to eat mushrooms. Um, there aren't that many mushrooms that can hurt us, but the ones that can hurt us are common, and they're good and easy to learn. Uh, please make your introduction on our thread. Some of you have done that. Just go to the forum. There's a, a link called Introductions, and just write some of the prompts that I told you about there. And then on to some of the fun stuff. So I introduced a little concept called the CSR triangle, and this is basically a concept that... Um, describes how plants reproduce, how they evolved, how to grow and compete with each other. So these three general um, CSR is competitive, stress tolerant, and ruderal. So I started off with ruderal because these are some of the more common plants that we'll find that we'll be foraging. And ruderal plants are plants that come in right after a disturbance. So you can think of a lot of these are your common weeds like dandelion and burdock and yellow dock. Um, a lot of cresses in the brassica family, so think watercress, closely related. Um, these are ruderal plants. They are annuals generally or biennials. So if they're annual, they grow during one season, produce, produce seeds, die, and then those seeds start the cycle over the next season. So those are annuals. They reproduce every one year and die every one year. Biennials will grow in one season, capture all that energy, and then store it into a root. And then the next year, they will shoot up a flower stalk, produce seeds, and then those seeds will repeat the cycle either that year or the next year. So biennial, reproduce in two years, annuals, one year. Um, and those are your ruderal plants. They take over disturbed spaces, colonize it, they get their roots in the soil, they save that soil. It's almost like a quick band-aid for a damaged earth. And that's the basics of ruderal. A lot of our crops are ruderal. They're these annual crops. So we plant the seed and are able to harvest the fruit by the end of the year. Think your eggplants, corn, 
lot of these, these things are rootable plants, annual plants. Next section is stress tolerant. So these tolerants are longer lived than rooterol generally, and they put, um, they are the ones that are actually the longest lived. So they put a lot of energy into surviving as a, an individual. So you can think on top of a mountain, you'll sometimes see these very short, scrubby, evergreen plants. They have survived a long time. Some of them are hundreds of years old, and they don't put a lot of energy into reproduction. They'll produce sometimes smaller seeds. They won't produce as many seeds as a ruderal plant. And because they're living over a longer time, even if every year they only produce a handful of seeds, over their lifetime, they'll produce a lot of, um, a lot of new seeds, and those seeds will ideally perpetuate the, the species. Um, these plants are very susceptible to foraging because they're long-lived, because they don't reproduce a lot every year. Um, it's very easy for us to essentially extirpate these things locally. Um, ramps are a good example. They are longer-lived. Actually, ramps are not a good example. Ramps are competitive plants. Uh, sage, white sage. So if you think of smudging, uh, it's often done with sage. Um, smudging is a Native American term. I wish I knew, I should know which uh, specific tribes use that term, but smudging cannot be applied broadly. It's a very specific practice. Um, but white sage is used in these um, practices, and with the commercialization of some of these herbal practices, white sage has been taken out of a lot of its landscapes. Uh, there's a bird called the sage grouse that only grows and only reproduces in giant growths of white sage. They eat these during the winter and they reproduce in there. And as this sage habitat decreases, not only from harvesting for commercial use, but also you know destruction of habitat with agriculture, that landscape becomes smaller. So if you see longer lived species, definitely don't really want to harvest those unless you have a really good purpose and you know that you're um, doing it sustainably. Competitive plants are plants that they can establish pretty early after disturbance. They can be relatively long lived, but they produce a lot of seeds and they don't, um, they're actually fairly susceptible to browsing and herbivory. So a lot of these evergreens, a lot of those stress tolerant plants we're talked, we talked about, they can often taste really bitter, they taste bad, they're tough, they're hard to eat. Um, animals generally don't go after them. Competitive species can be commonly grazed. Things like deciduous trees, like maples and oaks. These have a lot of fleshy parts, a lot of animals eat them. They produce a lot of seeds every year um, in abundance, or not every year, but commonly. Um, oaks and some nut trees have mast years, so there's some years where there's a lot, and then there's not a lot, and there's a lot, and there's not a lot, and this helps to prevent um, predators of their seeds from getting too overpopulated. But competitive plants are very common. A lot of our deciduous forests are competitive plants predominantly, and they, um, yeah, like I said, they can be susceptible to herbivory, but they also reproduce a lot of seeds. And then we have our descriptions of annual plants. I said annual plants, they reproduce every year and die every year. So things like um, chickweed or dandelion grow quickly, produce a seed, the seed, um, the, the plant then dies as the seed reproduces and, and perpetuates the species. Biennial plants do that, essentially that same concept over two years, hence the biennial. And then perennial plants are plants that live more than two years um, and they can, they can take a long time to start reproducing seeds. These are plants that we often have to be careful about harvesting. Ramps, is <clears throat> ramps are the perfect example. They take seven years to go from seed to seed. Um, so if you are going into a patch of ramps and you're taking that bulb out, that plant may never have even have had the opportunity to reproduce. So ramps are really um, something we have to be careful about and plants like that that are being over harvested, we should really try to cultivate them because you can produce them, you can have them on your own. Also, you can just clip the leaves of ramps. You can take one leaf from each plant and they'll still be able to produce their, um, their seeds and they'll still be able to get enough energy to put it in their bulb for the next year. So that's plant life cycles. Um, keep those in mind as we learn our plants. Here are the basic rules of foraging. First one, probably most important one, only eat something if you know exactly what you're looking at. That goes in general. You would not eat a plate of food if you weren't certain that it was edible, certain that it wasn't going to poison you. Um, yeah, if you are 100% on your identification and 100% that it's edible, you'll be fine. Rule number two, uh, when eating something for the first time, only eat a small amount. You know, everybody reacts to plants differently. Everybody reacts to every sort of food differently. I can eat peanut butter and I'm fine. Some people 
will die if they touch it. So we don't know always what happens with uh, the plants and mushrooms that we're trying to eat. Um, most of the plants we'll be going over are fine. I will tell you specifically if anything, you know, I have had some reactions um, with some things and I'll, I'll tell you some of the plants that can be more likely to cause something or the mushrooms that can kind of be a little bit more in between. Um, and you can also have sometimes compounding effects. So I had one winter where I found pounds and pounds and pounds of winter oysters, decided it was a really good idea to eat about a pound of these a day. And then one night when I went out with a friend to a bar and had a couple beers, I broke out in hives. I've never had hives before, never had them since. Just turned out that eating that many oyster mushrooms at that time with how my body was feeling health-wise caused me to have a reaction. I have some guesses as why it happened, but now I just, I don't go overboard on oyster mushrooms. I can eat oysters, but I don't eat a ton of them. Um, alcohol can and sometimes have adverse impacts with mushrooms. Um, uh, shaggy manes are the main mushroom that I think of where you can actually have a really, really bad reaction if you have shaggy manes with alcohol. It can make you feel really sick. Um, it inhibits the breakdown of alcohol and it's just not a good combination. So there are some mushrooms that you can be more, com more cautious around alcohol with. Rule number three, do not harvest plants growing near roads, railroads, old houses, um, and you should be careful around old apple trees and uh, apple orchards. So on our roads, we had uh, tetraethyl lead, or basically leaded gasoline. So as cars drove by, they would burn gasoline with lead. That lead wouldn't go very far, go within 100 yards of the road, settle down, and then that lead stays there. Lead is an element. It doesn't break down, technically. Um, so it's not going to degrade. If you have lead in your soil, you have lead in your soil, unless that gets leached away or there's some other thing. But near roads, they tend to have high levels of lead and all sorts of other metals that we get from our cars. Uh, railroads, similar thing. When we burn coal, it has lots of other heavy metals in it, and that can settle right down next to your railroad. So think of rail trails. So a lot of times cities are turning old railroad railways into rail trails. You don't want to harvest right next to those. 100 yards, again, is a good, a good safety net. Paint. We used lead in paint before 1978, so any old houses or any old construction that had paint on it before 1978, those lead from the paint can chip off, stay in the soil, and if you're harvesting it, potential to have lead in the food that you're eating. Orchards, they used to use uh, something called copper acetoarsenate and calcium arsenate. Arsenic is a poison. It's also a heavy metal. We don't want to eat it, so again, it's that heavy metal, it's an element, it'll stay in the ground wherever it is. So if you come across a place that has lots of old apple trees, there's a possibility that it was an orchard and you wouldn't want to harvest, say, mushrooms from there. A lot of people associate morels with apple orchards, but if you have that metal, those morels can actually hyperaccumulate. They can concentrate the metals into their tissues. So be careful with that. And then some add-ons, aquatic plants, a lot of our waters tend to have heavy metals as well because um, heavy metals find the low point in the land. So water will take up metals and then deposit it in say the sediment of a river or a pond or anything like that. So just be careful with harvesting water plants. Uh, rule number four, which I mentioned before, some mushrooms can have reactions to alcohol. Be careful, read up on the mushrooms before you eat them if there is any um, any reaction. There are some certain mushrooms you have to be careful with that we'll, we'll go through as we go along. Um, rule number five, it's not really a rule of foraging, but ticks. Check for ticks. A lot of us live in areas that are have very high levels of Lyme disease. Lyme disease is carried by the deer tick, which you should look it up online for its identification. My rule, I'm outside all the time. Um, I don't think not going outside is a good way to avoid this because there's so many benefits of being outside. So just every night after you've been outside, do a full body tick check. Helps you if you have a partner that can do a full body tick check. Um, my partner and I actually, actually sometimes will just use a flashlight if it's darker and just go over your whole body. Make sure you see things. Um, nymphal uh, ticks can be very, very small and almost see-through. So you just want to be very careful. If you feel something on your body, like that feels kind of like a itch or a whatever, just kind of like check it out. I've A lot of times I'll feel something, I'm like, feels like something's crawling, it's really small. I'll look and there is a deer tick, but pick it off, I kill it. And there's a lot of ticks out there and just be careful with that. Um, 
you know, your dogs, your cats can bring those things in too. So just be careful with ticks. And that is, that's it for the extra reading this week. Um, if you have any questions about anything, again, please reach out, post on this forum, ask questions, send me those pictures, get those doodle, um, doodle surveys filled out. Let's get our phone call times set up. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know.